Hello viewers, uh, we have discussed the general purpose programmable IO device, the 8 to 55A and we have seen how we can interface different types of input output devices using synchronous and asynchronous mode. We have also discussed a special purpose programmable display device 8 to 79 which can be used to interface the LED displays. Now in this lecture we shall consider two very important programmable special purpose IO devices. One, one is for interrupt which is known as programmable interrupt controller and another is for DMA controller, programmable DMA controller. And uh, we shall see how these devices can be used for efficient implementation of interrupt driven data transfer and DMA mode of data transfer. Now let us see why the, we need a programmable interrupt controller. Uh, we have seen that a microprocessor is usually provided two types of interrupts. One is known as non-maskable interrupt NMI. Another is maskable interrupt. Let me write it as IRQ, interrupt request. Now, this interrupt request can be of low active or high active depending on the processor. Now, a particular microprocessor must have at least two interrupt lines. One is non-maskable interrupt, another is maskable interrupt. Normally, the non-maskable interrupt is used for special purpose situations, special situations like power failure. Whenever power failure occurs, then the non-maskable interrupt is used to sense that and to take prevent to take suitable measure for power failure. However, the maskable interrupts are used for uh, interrupt driven data transfer. We have seen that in case of 8085, we have a number of maskable interrupts. But in general, in most of the microprocessors, you will see there is only one maskable interrupt input. So whenever you have got a single maskable interrupt input, how do you provide interrupt driven DMA data, uh, interrupt driven data transfer to a large number of IO devices? you may be having a large number of input output devices and you have to give interrupt driven data transfer to them. How do you do that? That means the interrupt will come from a large number of input output devices or sources. So how a single interrupt input can be used to generate interrupt from a large number of IO devices? It can be done by using say if it is a low active you can use uh, that WED or configuration. So normally it is connected to VCC. Then the interrupts coming from different sources, say source one, source two, this is coming from another one, say this is from device one, IO one, IO two. In this way, it can be connected to a number of devices. or say another one, so IO device, IO2, IO3, IO4 and so on. Now in this WED or configuration, as you can see here, if none of the interrupt inputs are active, if none of the lines are 1, that means here it is 0, then this output is high, no interrupt is generated. But if any one of them is active, that means any one of them, the only one of these inputs is high here, then this line will be low. That means interrupt coming from any one of the sources will make this line 0 and interrupt will be generated. It can be done this way. Another possibility is that suppose you have got a uh, interrupt input which is high active. In this case, you can put one uh, say two, one inverter and a NOR gate and then interrupts can come to each of these lines. So this is from uh, IO1, this is from IO2, this is from, in this way you can connect a number of devices. So this is how interrupt can be generated 
from a number of input output devices. But whenever interrupt is coming from a number of I.O. devices, the CPU must know from where the interrupt has come. So to do that, you have to use what is known as device pooling. Device pooling has to be used to identify the source of interrupt, how it can be done. There are two basic approaches. One is known as software polling. In software polling, let me explain the software polling in little bit detail. So software polling. In software polling, what you do, suppose the interrupt Whenever an interrupt comes, normally as we know, suppose the program was executing this main program and whenever an interrupt comes, suppose interrupt has come at this moment, then after executing the current instruction, it will jump to a interrupt service subroutine normally, interrupt service subroutine. But whenever you have got a large number of input interrupting sources, it jumps to instead of interrupt service subroutine, it jumps to what is known as interrupt level subroutine. So it jumps to a special subroutine known as interrupt level subroutine, ILS. And then this purpose of this interrupt level service servicing is to identify the source of interrupt and then jump to a particular interrupt service subroutine. That means you can have a number of interrupt service subroutines corresponding to different interrupts. After the, this is for interrupts, say, I, I, interrupt service subroutine 1, interrupt service, service subroutine 2, interrupt service subroutine n and so on. After identifying the source of interrupt, it will jump to one of the interrupt service subroutines. Question is, how this interrupt level subroutine identifies the source of interrupt by software means. This can be done by performing, uh, by reading the status uh, from the I.O. port. We have already discussed the interrupt driven mode of data transfer implemented by using 8255. Here you see a PC3 bit, which is representing the INTRA interrupt technology. Here PC0 for port B, that means your group B. Whenever they are used, these, these port A and port B are used as interrupt inputs, as uh, input as input port, and interrupt driven mode of data transfer is used. After a data is latched in, then this interrupt is generated. And this interrupt, whenever the interrupt is generated, as you can see here, interrupt is generated, then this PC3 bit will go high. So the microprocessor can read the port C and find out the value of this PC3 bit. Or it can read, whenever it is using port B, it can read PC0 bit. Say you are using 8255, uh, several 8255s. So you can read these bits, PC3, PC0 of different uh, programmable I.O. ports, uh, PPI, uh, programmable peripheral interspace devices or whenever it is used as output device as you can see here after you write something interrupt is generated interrupt goes low and whenever interrupt comes then another write will take place and in this case as you can see by looking at this pc3 bit or pc0 bit the source of interrupt can be identified that means the microprocessor will go keep on reading the port bit values to identify which particular interrupt bit has been, has become one. And this can be uh, diagrammatically explained like this. Say here it is. So whenever you have got a large number of I.O. devices, as you can see, this polling program keeps on checking from that, pro uh, that uh, keeps on checking the uh, status of the uh, interrupt line, interrupt bit this device, this device, this device and so on. Then the by that the CPU can identify as the source of interrupt. And this is how this uh, interrupt level subroutine works. 
but whenever you are having a large number of input output devices, this interrupt level subroutine will take very long time and this will lead to very long response time. And whenever the microprocessor is used for say real time applications, this long response time may not be desirable. So this response time should not be long, particularly in you will see that in case of uh, this real time systems, interrupt system is interrupt uh, operation is very important. And the response to that interrupt is also very important. If the response is, does not come within a very short time, then the real time system will not work properly. So uh, to overcome this problem, you have to use what is known as hardware polling. Instead of doing it by hardware, you have to use the hardware polling technique. Hardware polling technique can be explained by this simple diagram. Here, uh, as usual, you have got the microprocessor, RAM, ROM, and a number of input output devices. But in addition to this, you have got a special purpose device known as programmable interrupt controller, PIC. And all these IO devices will send the interrupts not to the microprocessor, but it will go to the programmable interrupt controller. Then the whenever there is any interrupt from input output devices, either uh, device number one or two or n, it will receive an interrupt and this programmable interrupt controller in turn will generate an interrupt to the CPU. Then once the interrupt comes from the uh, programmable interrupt controller, the CPU will generate interrupt acknowledge, INTA, interrupt acknowledge. And whenever this interrupt technology is received by this programmable interrupt controller, this will provide the information to the CPU, the source of interrupt. So source of interrupt will be interrupt will be information will be provided by the programmable interrupt controller uh, by uh, interrupt directly to the CPU. And as a result, it will lead to a small response time. And let us look at the inner world of this uh, programmable interrupt controller, what is inside and so on. This is the popular 8259 programmable interrupt controller, which is used uh, in conjunction with uh, Intel series of microprocessor. As you can see here, this side goes to the microprocessor and it has got data bus buffer, the tri-state buffers and other things are there. There is read light logic where those standard read write control signals are coming and one address line is also coming, then the chip select. Then there is a, uh, later on we shall explain about this. You can cascade several interrupt controllers uh, to facilitate a large number of uh, devices, interfacing of large number of devices. This side you have got the control logic. This is interfacing with that a microprocessor, it generates that interrupt through this line and that interrupt acknowledge coming from the microprocessor comes to this input. And this side, the interrupts are coming from eight interrupting sources that interrupt request zero up to interrupt request seven, interrupts are coming from eight interrupting sources and it goes to a interrupt request register. And that information is hold into, into this interrupt request register. And there are two more registers, interrupt mask register. This is a programmable register. You can selectively mask any one of these in interrupt inputs. So interrupt mask register will hold the information about the interrupt inputs which, which are to be masked. Obviously, this can be done by programming. And the in-service register actually decides the priority and which particular uh, interrupt input should be given higher priority, lower priority and so on. So based on this information coming from this in-service register, coming from this interrupt mask register, coming from this interrupt request register, this priority resolve, resolver decides which particular interrupt should be accepted at a particular instant. There may be a large number of interrupts coming in uh, simultaneously 
and accordingly it will generate an interrupt. And whenever that interrupt request comes, then this in this particular device will generate the uh, source of uh, interrupt. Let me explain how it is being done. The sequence of events is shown in this diagram. First of all, one or more interrupt request lines are raised high setting the corresponding IRL bit. That means first this interrupt comes, the, uh, whenever any one of these interrupt line comes, this corresponding bit will be set. And after evaluating the request, the 8 to 5 9 sends an INT to the microprocessor. That means, as I said, that priority resolver will evaluate the information stored, I mean the interrupt requests coming, the interrupt mask register contents, the in-service register contents, and then it will uh, request the control logic, uh, logic to generate an interrupt. That is what is being done. And in response to this, the microprocessor acknowledges the interrupt and responds with an INTA pulse, interrupt acknowledge pulse, this comes. And whenever this comes, the, the, uh, the after receiving this INTA uh, highest, uh, from the highest priority ISR bit is set. That means a particular interrupt request is accepted and corresponding in-service in request bit is set and the corresponding interrupt uh, request register bit is reset. And what the microprocessor does, a call instruction code, as you know that call instruction code is CD. The CD generated on the data bus, the microprocessor generates CD in response to that interrupt acknowledge signal. So normally as you know, this call uh, instruction is coming from the memory. But in this case, the interrupt controller is generating that uh, CD instruction. And whenever the CD instruction comes, as you know, the it will it will it will be followed by two INA cycles, and the lower order bit followed followed by higher order bit address will be also generated by this microprocessor by this uh, interrupt controller. So interrupt controller will not only generate a call instruction CD on the data bus, it will also generate two more addresses the lower order byte and higher order byte address on this data bus, which is essentially the vector address for this corresponding uh, micro corresponding interrupting source. And obviously the microprocessor jumps to the subroutine address and in, in automatic end of interrupt mode, the ISR bit is reset at the end of the third INA cycle. Otherwise, you have to do it by programming. So this is how it works. Now obviously, it will not work on its own. The user must program it, initialize the programmable interrupt controller and for that purpose, the interrupt controller is provided with a number of resistors and these are the uh, various resistors. These, the, there are four resistors for initialization which are known as initialization command words. ICW1, ICW2, ICW3 and ICW4. Although there are four command words, usually I mean two are sufficient in most of the situations. However, there are some situations where you will require four. Let us see uh, what are the, what, what is provided by this. To generate, to, to, ac to access this particular register, what has to be done? This bit, A0 bit is shown here. A0 bit has to be zero. And these are the data values that you have to write into this register. Obviously, when chip select is zero and this bit is zero, then it will go to that initialization command word. And what you are doing, you are writing into the register this information. The address A5, A5 A6 and A7, this bit is one. L, uh, this this is this stand for uh, L uh, level triggered input mode. That means the whether the interrupt inputs will be level triggered or edge triggered. That is that can be set with the help of this. If this is one, then it is level triggered. Otherwise, it is edge triggered. ADI stands for address interval. Address interval can be uh, four bytes or eight bytes. That means with the help of these two bits, these two bytes, as you can see here. A5, A6 and A7, 
you are providing the 3 bits and 8 bits are here, remaining bits are decided based on the various addresses. How let me explain. The vector address that can be generated by the interrupt controller can be like this say A15, A8, then A7, A6, A5, A4, A3, A2 and A1 uh, and A0. These are the addresses which are generated. Now you are you are writing down in these registers these bits the A52. In the initialization comment words, you are supplying the information of A5 to A15. That means A5 to A15. These bits are provided as part of this initialization comment words. So the remaining bits can start with 0, 0, 0, 0. And it can be 0. Then the, this is the first address. Second address can be 4 byte apart. 4, 4, 4 byte apart. That means it can be 0, 0, 0, then 0, 0 and the remaining bits will be decided by the program. If the interval is 4 byte, that means for this first interrupt IRQ 0, interrupt request 0, the vector address will be this part and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. For IRQ 1, interrupt request 1, the address will be this part which is provided and then 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. For the next address, it will be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 4 bit wide. That means after 4 bit, uh, 4, 4 locations. On the other hand, if the spacing is interval is 8, then the first address will be 0, 0, 0, 0 next address will be 1000 and so on 8 byte wide 8 byte after 8 byte locations in other words what i am trying to tell the vector addresses of these interrupts will be uh, higher order bits are provided as part of this uh, initialization command words and lower order bits are automatically generated depending on which particular interrupt is being uh, accessed I mean is, is active and they, they are spacing the space between two interrupt input uh, vector addresses can be either four locations or eight locations that can be decided by program. And uh, SG, SNGL stands for single. It's, it specifies that whether there is a single 8259 or there are multiple 8259. Later on we shall see that in a single system you can have only one 8259 or you can have uh, up to nine 8259. So whenever you have got a single 8259, eight interrupt inputs it can service. Whenever you, you can you can you are having nine uh, devices 8259, up to 64 uh, interrupt inputs can be serviced by the interrupt controller. So depending on whether it is single or uh, more than one then of course the these bits are active i shall explain about these things later on uh, whenever multiple devices are used then these are necessary and uh, initialization command words uh, may be required may not be required by default it will be uh, it will not be required but there are some special functions like uh, special fully nested mode auto uh, end of interrupt, there are some special modes and whether it is for 8085 or not or 8086, all these things can be specified by these initialization common words. And it will decide whether uh, um, it will decide some special modes of operations that we, that we shall explain little later. And when all these initialization common words are programmed, then it is ready to accept interrupts and it will perform uh, it will do whatever I have explained. This sequence of events will take place only after the initializations are done. And also it can, uh, there are some special operation command words with the help of which you can mask some of these interrupts. And whenever you are using uh, 
a number of devices, then there are levels can be decided. So these are special functions. I am not going into the details because of lack of time, but you have to program those initialization uh, uh, command words and operation command words uh, by addressing different bits and selecting the chip before the device is ready for receiving interrupts. And after the interrupts are received, the sequence of events that will take place, I, should, I have already explained. Now, let us consider the situation where the number of interrupt inputs is more than 8. In such a situation, only one programmable interrupt controller will not serve the purpose. So how you can interface several uh, 8 to 5, 9 to a single system, let me discuss that. This technique is known as cascading of cascading the 8 to 5, 9. So whenever you are cascading 8 to 5, 9, 1 8 to 5, 9 will be the master. As it is shown here in this particular uh, system, I have got 3 8 to 5, 9 and one of them is master, 8 to 5, 9 A, this one is the master and to designate a master, this particular pin SPEN. This line is connected to VCC and whenever uh, this line is connected to ground, then it acts as a slave. So you can see here in this system, you have got two slave 8 to 5, 9 devices and one master 8 to 5, 9 devices. So apart from these pins, what are the other differences? Let us try to understand. You can see here this interrupt is directly going to the interrupt input of the microprocessor. On the other hand, the interrupts lines from the slaves are coming to one of the interrupt inputs of the master. They are not going directly to the uh, microprocessor's interrupt input, but the, these interrupts are generated by the, uh, these interrupt controllers are coming to the interrupt inputs of the master instead of going to the, uh, directly to the microprocessor. Moreover, you can see here, whenever this line is grounded, this CAS, CAS0, CAS1, CAS2, these are essentially cascade signals with the help of which these slaves can be addressed. And here, these are output, so far as master is concerned, and for slaves, these are inputs going to all the slaves. Now, in this case, as you can see here, what are the total number of inputs? Say we have got one master and two slaves. You can see here 8 plus 8, 16 plus 6. So you have got 22 interrupt inputs that can be serviced with the help of three devices. And let me now explain the operation of this initialization command word, which was shown here. ICS, the ICW3. You can see here whenever you are using a single device, then this particular initialization command word is skipped, no need for programming. On the other hand, whenever you have got multiple uh, devices, multiple interrupt controllers, then you have to program it. So here S0 to S7. So S0 to S7 designates whether a slave is connected to zero input one input or not. If a slave is connected, this bit has to be set to 1. If it is not connected, this bit has to be set to 0. So in this way, to all these 8 inputs, you can connect one slave. And whenever you have got 8 such slaves, you, you can have altogether uh, 8 slaves. That means 8 into 8, 64 interrupt inputs. So by using this programmable uh, special purpose programmable interrupt controller, you can service 64 input output devices. Their priorities and everything can be decided, their interrupt level, priority, everything can be controlled with the help of these devices. And uh, as you can see here, uh, cascading is not very difficult uh, to implement. And uh, uh, this 8259A is very popular 
used in your all the Intel series of microcomputers, for example, in your PCs, IBM PCs, this 8259 is used because you have to provide the interrupt defense service to a large number of devices. So one 8259 is provided in that uh, motherboard of IBM PC. So this is not only used in case of 8085, it can be used for higher order microprocessors and that can be provided, that information is provided here. If it is 0, then it is 8085, if it is 1, then 8086 or higher order, higher other uh, Intel series microprocessors. And obviously some of the common words and other things will be little different. So we have seen that this interrupt controller is providing facility to uh, give service to a large number of devices and the response time that is providing is also very small because the uh, address that is getting generated uh, here is very quick because the programmable interrupt controller is providing the vector address. So vector address is coming from the interrupt controller instead of the uh, by software means it is being generated. So after briefly introducing this programmable interrupt controller, let us switch gear and discuss another very important uh, programmable device that is your uh, DMA controller. We have already discussed the uh, DMA controller mode of data transfer. I have already introduced the basic concept, you know that. And I have explained that you require a DMA controller to facilitate DMA mode of data transfer and just like the programmable interrupt controller here also the DMA request from input output devices come to the DMA controller and DMA controller in turn generates the DMA request to the microprocessor. And whenever DMA is granted then microprocessor tri state the bus and DMA controller becomes the master of the bus. It controls the I.O. device and uh, memory device and then direct data transfer between memory and I.O. devices and take place. I have already discussed this earlier. Now let us go into the inner world of this DMA controller. What is inside? This 825957 programmable DMA controller uh, provides four channels. That means it can give DMA mode of data, it can support DMA mode of data transfer from, I mean, uh, uh, transfer for four input output devices. So this is for channel 0, channel 1, channel 2, and channel 3. And these are going to the IO devices. As I, as I explained, that lines are going to the IO devices. So here you see this will go to device 1, this will go to device 2, this will go to device 2, this will go to device 3. So device side IO, this, this goes to the IO device side. On the other hand, this side is pretty complex. This goes to the microprocessor side. Why it is a little bit complex? Because this side, through, through this side, the DMA controller not only interacts with the microprocessor, but also it interacts with the uh, memory and IO devices. That means the addresses are generated by the DMA controller when DMA controller is the master. That's why this side is a little bit complex uh, and it has got uh, the necessary data bus buffer, tri-state buffers are inside it, read-write logic with the help of which you can uh, write into various registers provided in, in each of the channels. And also there is control logic and mode set registers. So the best, the beauty of programmable I.O. devices we have seen by initializing these registers. You can configure it in different modes. And let's see what are the registers provided in this programmable DMA controller. Uh, in programmable DMA controller, you have got uh, two registers. Uh, in each of these channels. So with which can be accessed with the help of this A0, A1, A2, and A3, which are connected here. A0, A1, A2, and A3. These address along with this chip select will decide 
chip select has to be low, we will decide which particular register is being, is being accessed. So, inside the device it has got uh, address register and count register. Each of these channels will have address register and a count register. So, address register is of 16 bit. So, first the uh, lower order byte can be programmed. There is an internal flip flop as you can see here address is same for lower order byte and higher order byte. But whenever you first access it, it goes to the lower order byte. That means when internal flip flop is 0, then as, as the accessing of the lower order byte is over, automatically this flip flop becomes 1. So, next time whenever you access, it goes to the higher order byte. So, this is how the same address is being used to access lower order byte and higher order byte. So, this is how you can load the address into the uh, into this at this register and the 14 bit control the count register is also accessed in the same manner. And this is how for channel 0, channel 1, channel 2 and channel 3 registers can be initialized. So, since the control the count register is 16 bit, what is the uh, maximum size of data that you can transfer in one go 14 bit. 14 bit means 16k. So, whenever DMA mode of data transfer, a block of 16k of data can be transferred between the IO device and the memory at a time. And this uh, mode set register which is write only has different bits as you can see here. This is the content of the mode set register and you can enable or, dis enable or disable various channels. You although you have got four channels, it may not be necessary that all of them uh, will be uh, operational simultaneously. You may disable some of the channels if no devices are connected there. So, that can be done with the help of these four bits, enable channel 0, channel 1, channel 2 and channel 3. And these bits will decide the priority. You can see here rotating priority. Rotating priority means normally uh, in normal situation the priority will be uh, suppose you have got uh, four all the four devices are there. That means device 0, 1, 2 and 3. So, the channel 0 will have the highest priority then channel 1, then channel 2 and channel 3, this will have the lowest priority. But what this, this, this you may not want, you may want that after channel 0 is serviced, this will have the lowest priority. So, in that case it can be rotating like this. Say after channel 0 is serviced, the highest priority device will become the uh, channel 1. Or then, and if this is service, then it becomes channel 2. So, in this way, the priority can be rotating, rotating priority can be used, and that can be decided with the help of this bit. So, the channels can have rotating priority, uh, and then this is your enable extended writing. If you want, the write signal may come early, uh, and because write signal is generated by the uh, DMA controller, DMA controller when the DMA controller is the master and that time it can be decided by that. And this enables terminal count stop whenever the con count register becomes 0, it, it can automatically stop or the, it, it can be ready for next uh, operations. And this is your enable auto load, auto load is for one particular channel, uh, if you want to transfer blocks of data continuously one after the other, then automatically the address register and control register will be loaded from channel 2 to channel 3. And that is how uh, the continuous block of transfers can be, I mean continuously a block of transfer can be performed. And that can be programmed by this. And with the help of this status register, the terminal count status that means whether 
the complete block of data have, has been transferred or not, that can be found out for by looking at these bits 0, 1, 2 and 3 and this is update flag bit which is used for updating the uh, status. Now this, this is, this is, these are the various registers provided inside this uh, DMA controller. So these are the address registers, these are the control registers, here is your mode set register and the, uh, the status register is also here. These registers are to be initialized before you start performing DMA mode of data transfer and after the initialization is done, then the device is ready to accept a request and whenever a request comes, then it will generate the, uh, uh, the DMA request to the microprocessor and after it gets the DMA grant, the DMA controller will generate the address based on, based on the address provided here and also it will keep on transferring data one byte per machine cycle uh, between an IO device and a memory device until the terminal that control is count register becomes zero and whenever it becomes zero that terminal count is reached that we have already mentioned. So in this way 16 kilobytes of data can be transferred uh, in a go with the help of this uh, DMA mode of data transfer. Now <coughs> question is how do you interface it to the 8085 microprocessor? Let us see how it can be interfaced to the 8085 microprocessor. This is how it can be interfaced. This is the DMA controller that 8257 and this side is the microprocessor side. So this is the address bus A8215 coming from the microprocessor and these are the AD0 to 7 lines and this is that latch 373 to demultiplex the address. So by using this address latch enable you get the demultiplex the address and here you get the A0 to A7 and D0 to D7 goes to the data bus. This is your data bus. Now the DMA controller is interfaced uh, for interfacing the DMA controller you require another latch. You can see here the A0 to A7 these are directly going to the lower order byte of address. These lines are going directly to the lower order byte address. A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, A7. These are directly going to the lower order byte address. But as you can see here, there is no higher order byte address here. So how the DMA controller will generate the higher order byte address when it has got no uh, higher order byte address lines? So what is being done? The higher order byte of address is generated by this through these data lines and it is latched into the into this 373 and 373 actually generates that higher order byte address and it goes to the higher order byte address. So here the address and data is multiplexed by this by these lines. The way the AD02 lines are are multiplexed lines coming from the microprocessor, the DMA controller is also having the multiplex data and address part bus. Here of course the data bus it goes directly to the data bus. Not only that it provides the higher order byte address and then that can be latched whenever this AD strobe signal is generated whenever the higher order byte address is generated it is latched into this bus uh, with the help of this line and goes to the uh, goes um, that that address is stored here in this latch and it is available for the remaining cycle and address enable signal is used to uh, try state either this latch output or this latch output when the microprocessor is the master which is generating the address data and so on then as you can see this line is high and only whenever sorry this line is low so this line is low means this will be active and the microprocessor will be uh, the master. On the other hand, when the DMA controller is the master, then address enable line is high 
and then this particular latch is active and this will generate the higher order byte address and which which is latched into this buffer through these data lines and this is the line which is going to the dma to the microprocessor as dma request this is the dma grant signal coming from the microprocessor and these are the conventional uh, io read io write memory read and memory write used for interfacing to the microprocessor side and this is the chip select obviously you will require a device decoder circuit uh, to generate the chip chip select which i have already explained so you can see here this is how this uh, this particular device can be used for uh, performing the uh, dma mode of data transfer and how this can be interfaced to the microprocessor this is also explained with the help of this diagram and uh, as you have seen it can provide service to four channels let me summarize what we have discussed today first of all we have discussed one programmable interrupt controller pic and pic can act as a especially uh, as a master for interrupt driven data transfer and as you can as you have seen already here it can provides uh, the eight interrupt levels in eight interrupt levels by a single by a single pic whenever you are interfacing a single programmable interrupt controller eight interrupt levels are provided by the pic and it can be extended it can be extended to Sixteen, uh, sixteen interrupt levels, whenever you cascade a number of programmable interrupt, interrupts and in such a case you will require, sorry not sixteen, you will, it can go up to sixty-four interrupt levels whenever you have got nine PICs. And another advantage is that we have seen that whenever you are using the 8085 interrupt inputs all the vector addresses are in that uh, 00, 00 page that means uh, the addresses are uh, so the rst 5.1 5.5 means 5.5 into 8 all belong to that 08th page but whenever you are you are using pic then the vector address can be anywhere and, and we have seen how it can be anywhere the address can be loaded into the uh, into the uh, those registers those initialization comment words those initialization comment words will be holding these values so by writing down any value here you can have the vector address anywhere on the address space however the spacing between two addresses can be either 4 byte or 8 byte so if, if your interrupt service subroutine cannot be written by using four locations or eight locations then obviously you have to jump to another part of the memory so that you can write a bigger program bigger interrupt service subroutine but the uh, uh, the uh, since you are writing only one address in the uh, register that's why this particular limitation is coming then you can have it resolves interrupt priorities
the priorities can be resolved with the help of that uh, there is a uh, special type of device we have priority resolver as you have seen inside the device with the help of which the priority is resolved and uh, as a consequence the there are various types of modes of priorities that is possible it can have uh, nested nested priority it can have automatic rotate rotating priority and any one of these inputs can be provided the lowest priority and you can mask all the interrupts whenever you, you want it that means mask give up interrupt is possible just like in your 8085 you have got that uh, mask bits that you can do by using those uh, rim instruction here you don't have to use the rim instruction you can in write a particular uh, uh, value into that register and masking is performed and you can read the status of any one of these uh, interrupts pending or not that status can be read so in short this is the functionalities of the programmable interrupt controller and obviously it is a very a versatile device similarly that the dma controller that i have discussed is also very versatile it supports four channels that you have seen it can provide also data transfer in a, in a go 16 kilobytes of blocks of data data can be that 16 kilobytes of blocks of data can be transferred between the IO device and the uh, memory devices then it also provides you rotating priority or fixed priority and and also the uh, we have seen that the dma controller is capable of performing uh, chaining reaction chaining means you can transfer blocks continuously so not once but continuously uh, blocks of transfer can be performed sometimes uh, suppose you have to refresh the display continuously that refreshing requires continuous updating of data that also can, can be performed by with the help of these DMA controllers. So in short these are the functions of these uh, this particular DMA controller and obviously whenever you are building a little powerful system like PC or server or workstation you will require these interrupt controllers and DMA controllers. But whenever you, you, are, you want to provide particularly the interrupt controller is very important whenever you are you want to provide support to a large number of input output devices but the microprocessor is provided with only one inter interrupt input. So we have seen with the help of this programmable interrupt controller and DMA controller how you can support interrupt driven data transfer and DMA mode of data transfer. And in the next lecture, we shall discuss about the serial mode of data transfer. And there also we will require another special purpose IO device that we shall discuss in the next lecture. Thank you.